Hello and welcome to the first out of five webinars that is hosted by Hong Kong as part of the Race to Zero webinar series. My name is Jas Beelkeizer and I'm with Arab in Hong Kong. Throughout this event, please feel free to post your comments and questions uh, in the chat box because at the end we have a panel discussion during which we will try to address those. Since we have such a tight schedule, um, I will now immediately pass the floor to Mr. Michael Kwok, our Arab East Asia Region Chair. Michael, over to you. Mr. K.S. Wong, Secretary for Environment, Environment Bureau. Mr. Ken Ofrati, COP26 Regional Ambassador to Asia Pacific and South Asia, Foreign Commonwealth and Development for Office. Ms. Rachel Skinner, President of Institution of Civil Engineer. Ms. Christina Gamboya, CEO of the World Green Building Council. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to this opening event of the Race to Zero webinar series for Hong Kong. In two weeks' time, the global country leaders will meet at Glasgow for the COP26 to agree their commitment on CO2 emission and policy, which will sufficiently reduce carbon emission to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. COP26 will be a key milestone that will determine the pace of climate change over the next few decades and perhaps future of mankind. As the world's biggest CO2 emitter and a key engine for global economic growth in the coming decades, Asia should play a leading role in the world's decarbonization and contributing to the success at the COP26. Home to some of the world's highest density cities, in low-lying areas, many Asian countries are highly susceptible to climate change and need actions to adapt and build resilience for the future. Our discussion on climate change should not end at policy level. Effective climate action requires cross-sectorial collaboration. While it is for governments to set the policy for climate reduction, it is mainly for business leaders, professionals, and civic society to implement the changes and make all this happen. Concerned about the climate peril for decades, Arab is working with governments, business sector, and concerned groups around the world to define and implement climate plans, strategies, and projects worldwide for the positive change. While committed to become a net zero organization by 2030, we also recognize the need to make a greater impact and necessary action, not alone, but together. Hence, the key reason behind this webinar series is to bring together key stakeholders across Asia to deliver change, accelerate the transition. And we are encouraged to see the overwhelming support regarding this agenda. With over 30 strategic partner and supporting organizations, the series takes place across five major cities in Asia, and with over 50 thought leaders to share their views and best practices, together we will think and act at local level in response to the global challenge and achieve our shared ambition. Today's event marks the opening of the series, and during the rest of the week, we will dive into four themes that are crucial to address the climate emergency decarbonizing the built environment towards clean energy, nature-based solutions, low and net zero transport systems. At Hong Kong sessions, we have lined up top policymakers, business leaders, professionals, and our mental bodies to look at these themes in local contexts. We all have a role to play, sharing ideas, filling in the gaps with our unique background and expertise and helping advance the city's net zero agenda. Share, share problems call for shared solutions. Your voices and outcomes from this webinar will be captured, shared, and feedback to the COP26 within the larger context of climate actions. I hope you enjoy this and the subsequent sections and feel empowered that there are many like-minded people in the region and worldwide who want to collaborate in a journey to a net zero future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Michael Kwok, for kickstarting the event. 
We will now play a message from Mr. K.S. Wong, Hong Kong's SAR Secretary of the Environment. The event is timely. The Hong Kong Climate Action Plan 2050 was just published on 8th October 2021. Combating climate change is an important issue across the globe. Hong Kong has been responding positively to the goal of the Paris Agreement to limit the increase in the global average temperature. We published it in 2017, Hong Kong's Climate Action Plan 2030 Plus, with the implementation of various decarbonization measures. We are moving steadily towards the 2030 carbon reduction target. Hong Kong's carbon emissions reached the peak in 2014. Preliminary estimation shows that the per capita carbon emissions would be reduced from the peak level of 6.2 tons in 2014 to about 4.5 tons in 2020. In late 2020, the chief executive of Hong Kong SAR announced in her 2020 policy address that Hong Kong would strive to achieve carbon neutrality before 2020. She also chairs a new steering committee on climate change and carbon neutrality to formulate the overall strategy. As announced in the policy address this year, the Hong Kong's Climate Action Plan 2050, published earlier this month, has set out proactive strategies and measures on reducing carbon emissions to pursue more rigorous interim decarbonization targets to reduce Hong Kong's total carbon emissions by 50% before 2035 as compared to the 2005 levels. In 2019, electricity generation, transport and waste account for more than 90% of Hong Kong's carbon emissions. Therefore, our decarbonization work should focus on these three key areas. The major decarbonization strategies to tackle the three key areas are as follows. First, net zero electricity generation, energy saving and green building. Seizing using coal for daily electricity generation. Increase the share of renewable energy in the fuel mix for electricity generation. Try out the use of new energy and strengthen cooperation with neighboring regions to achieve the long-term target of net zero electricity generation before 2050, and reduce the overall electricity consumption of buildings through promoting green buildings, improving buildings' energy efficiency, and promoting a low-carbon lifestyle. Second, green transport achieve the long-term target of attaining zero vehicular emissions and zero carbon emissions in the transport sector before 2050 through the electrification of vehicles and ferries, development of new energy transport, and measures to improve traffic management. The government will cease the new registration of fuel-propelled and hybrid private cars in 2035 or earlier, apart from promoting electric buses and commercial vehicles, the government also plans to collaborate with the franchised bus companies and other stakeholders in the next three years to test out hydrogen fuel cell electric buses and heavy vehicles. Third, waste reduction. To achieve the long-term target of carbon neutrality, in waste management before 2050, the government will strive to develop adequate waste to energy and waste to resources facilities by 2035. The government will also further promote waste reduction and recycling and expects to implement waste charging in 2023 and regulate disposable plastic paperwares, etc., in phases from 2025 onwards. The Environment Bureau will also set up a new Office of Climate Change 
and carbon neutrality to strengthen coordination and promote deep decarbonization. Also, a dedicated advisory committee on combating climate change will be formed to encourage different sectors in the community, including young people, to participate actively in climate actions. Climate change represents both a challenge and an opportunity. In the next 15 to 20 years, the government will devote about 240 billion Hong Kong dollars to take forward various measures on climate change mitigation and adaptation. Substantial resources from the private sector will also be necessary to achieve low carbon transformation. Green economy transformation has become a world trend. As an intellectual financial center with a huge financial market and a robust world-class regulatory framework, Hong Kong draws in world-leading financial and professional institutions, green assessment and certification organizations, as well as intellectual investors. With these capabilities and advantages, we are well placed to develop our city into the regional green finance hub, which can in turn support wider adoption of clean energy and green buildings, etc., within and outside Hong Kong. Innovation and technology can play a critical role in achieving carbon neutrality. The government has set up the 200 million Hong Kong dollars Green Tech Fund to provide better and more focused funding support to research and development projects which can help Hong Kong decarbonize and enhance environmental production. Climate change is an imminent global challenge that knows no border. The climate crisis can be effectively dealt with only if the government, the private sector, the professionals, and the civil society join forces for timely actions. I look forward to working with you in achieving the various targets set out in Hong Kong's Climate Action Plan 2050 and building a sustainable community of common destiny for mankind. Thank you. To further set the scene, we will now also hear from Ken O'Flaherty, UK government's COP26 regional ambassador to Asia, Pacific and South Asia, Rachel Skinner, CEO of the Institution of Civil Engineers, and Christina Gamboa, CEO of the World Green Building Council. Hello, I'd like to thank Arup, the UK's COP26 sustainability consultant and all supporting organisations for holding this event and inviting me to speak today on behalf of the Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office, as well as the UK's COP26 unit. Two weeks from today marks a pivotal moment. Parties all across the globe will come together at the COP26 summit in Glasgow to accelerate action towards the goals of the Paris Agreement and the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. In August, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change published the first part of its sixth assessment report. This report is a wake-up call. The world's top climate scientists say that we'll likely reach 1.5 degrees warming within two decades unless we take immediate action. We're already seeing the effects of climate change on our doorstep in Asia, including extreme heat waves, tropical cyclones and flash floods, and those are only going to intensify. However, with immediate, concerted global action to reduce emissions now, the worst impacts can still be averted. There's real change happening across countries, civil society and the private sector, and it's vital that the negotiations inside the conference centre reflect the reality outside. So as COP26 presidency, the UK has four core goals. The first is mitigation. We need to secure global net zero and keep 1.5 degrees within reach. We're urging all countries to come forward with ambitious 2030 emissions reductions targets and a plan for how they will reach net zero by mid-century. The second is adaptation. 
We need to adapt to protect communities and natural habitats. Even if we stopped emissions rising today, the world would still need to deal with significant climate disruption. Adapting to climate impacts is crucial as we see these worsen. The third is finance. Realising the goals of the Paris Agreement and meeting global net zero requires a transformation of global finance. To assist developing countries, developed countries must deliver on their commitment to mobilise $100 billion every year in climate finance by 2020 through to 2025. And last but not least is collaboration. Only by working together internationally can we accelerate the transition to global net zero at the pace required. With focused collaboration across governments, businesses and civil society, we can make real progress in the largest emitting sectors of power, road transport and land use. We expect COP26 to keep the possibility alive of the world staying on a 1.5 compatible pathway. The road ahead isn't easy, but each and every one of you watching have a part to play in saving our planet from this crisis. Let's work together to do just that. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of this exciting series of Race to Zero events across Asia in the run up to COP26. This is clearly a crucial effort to rally real leadership and commitment from practitioners, businesses, society and policymakers to help address the climate crisis right now. Through my role as president of the Institution of Civil Engineers, we have now put climate action at the very top of our strategic agenda. Right now, infrastructure, so everything that forms part of the built environment, such as transport, buildings, energy, water, waste, digital and more, infrastructure systems can be linked to around 70% of the world's carbon dioxide emissions because of the way that we plan, design, build and then use them over many generations. So civil engineers have an enormous responsibility and an opportunity to work as fast as we can to support a net zero carbon position while also making sure that our infrastructure is ready for and much more resilient to the increasing climate extremes that we know are coming in the decades ahead. We have a proud and respected heritage of improving communities and lives all over the world, providing sanitation and clean water, safe homes and workplaces, creating places and connections between those places to give ever more opportunities for our growing world population. But to now, our work has carried a carbon cost. Our challenge is to continue to deliver the same valuable outcomes for people and places, but to do it in ways that also halt and put right the damage to our environment and doing more to protect communities across the world so they have the chance to thrive in future. Thank you. Hello. The warnings from the latest IPCC report were another stark reminder of what we already know. Climate change is not a problem of the future. It is right here, right now, and it is negatively impacting every region of the world. If we don't take action now to drastically reduce emissions, we stand no chance of limiting global heating to 1.5 degrees Celsius. The good news is the built environment has a big role to play it can make a huge difference. Buildings are responsible for almost 40% of global energy-related carbon emissions and 50% of all extracted materials. By 2050, 1.6 billion urban dwellers will be regularly exposed to extreme high temperatures, and over 800 million people living in more than 570 cities will be vulnerable to sea level rise and coastal flooding. Also, the world's building stock by 2060 will double and almost 70% of global population will be living in urban areas. So the building and construction sector's demand on natural resources accelerates climate change and inefficient, unhealthy buildings negatively impact human health and well-being. So efficient buildings has to be the biggest investment opportunity of the years to come, and it is worth 24.7 trillion by 2030. The good news is that we're working in this direction together. At COP26, World GPC is helping to convene stakeholders across the building and construction sector to highlight the built environment's massive potential 
to tackle climate change and build resilience for people and economies. This collaboration has led to the announcement of Cities, Regions and Built Environment Day that will take place on 11th of November 2021. This is just the beginning. Now it's time to continue working together. Now it's time to follow shared climate action pathways. Now it's time to set exponential goals for sustainable buildings for everyone, everywhere. Thank you. The second part of the webinar series includes panel presentations and a panel discussion on how these global challenges can be addressed in a local context. This part will be moderated by Professor Johnny Tran, Emeritus Professor, School of Energy and Environment of the City University of Hong Kong. Please be reminded to post your questions in the chat box as we aim to address those in the Q&A session at the end. Professor, over to you. Good afternoon. Welcome to the first of the uh, webinar series on combating climate change in Hong Kong. Now, so climate change in, combating climate change in Hong Kong, when people talk about this, then you will usually talk about mitigation, decarbon that is decarbonization, which is the main theme of this series of webinars. And of course, the idea of mitigation is to reduce global warming and climate change. But equally important in combating climate change is adaptation to climate change impacts because some of these climate change impacts have already affected many of us. And the idea of doing this is to build up climate resilience. So in the East Asia region, this is especially important because we have typhoons affecting the coastal regions uh, and that will give strong winds that will break the windows and also cause big ships to go aground. Typhoons can also give overtopping <coughs> waves and storm surge, which can lead to flooding. And flooding will also be caused not only by typhoons, but also monsoons and the increasing urbanization in the East Asia region. In addition to typhoons, we have heat waves, which is a result of global warming and urbanization. And this is an example of the temperatures in Hong Kong when the number of days with maximum temperatures over 33 degrees has been on the rise, as well as the number of days with minimum temperatures greater than 28 degrees that hit an unprecedented maximum in 2020. So the trends in these climate impact events due to global warming is that we expect, for the heavy rain, we expect an increasing frequency due to global warming, urbanization, monsoon rains, and typhoons affecting coastal areas in East Asia. In terms of sea level rise, we ex expect a continued sea level rise and even an accelerated sea level rise. In terms of storm surge, we expect the extreme storm surge to increase due to the increasing typhoons affecting coastal areas in East Asia. And together with that, we have an increasing possibility of extreme winds affecting coastal areas and also increasing temperatures due to global warming and urbanization. Now, the first three items will therefore lead to more severe flooding. The extreme winds will lead to more wind damage and the increasing temperatures will lead to more heat waves. So therefore, when we talk about combating climate change, we will not only need to look at the left-hand side on mitigation, but we also need to think about how we should adapt to climate change impacts. Now, today we'll be focusing on the left-hand side, and I will now introduce our distinguished panel of speak, uh, panelists. So we have, first of all, on my left, Mr. Brian Davidson, the British Council General to Hong Kong and Macau, and then Next to him is Mr. Hao Wai Chung, the chairman of the Hong Kong Green Building Council. And next to him is Ms. Nicole Wong, the CEO of WWF Hong Kong. So let me ask you first, Brian, uh, during the video just now you saw that we learned that there are four goals of the UK presidency during COP26, which are mitigation, <coughs> adaptation, finance, and collaboration. So what is the role of the British Council General in Hong Kong to foster these goals? Uh, so, Professor, thank you for that introduction, and I'm honoured to be able to speak at this uh, key event in this series. As we all know, COP26 is about two weeks away, and it really is a critical juncture for the world 
if we are going to deliver on the promises we made in Paris five years ago. Now, for the United Kingdom, our uh, responsibility as COP26 uh, presidency is, of course, around the leadership of the negotiation process and in advancing commitment and actions around the four goals that uh, Ken O'Flaherty has talked about with countries and cities around the world in the run-up to this climate conference. First of all, obviously, the United Kingdom has to lead by example. We have to walk the walk. We have to be able to demonstrate that we have the same commitment that we are asking of other governments, but also of non-state actors like businesses and industry in this race to zero. We have to be able to support the shared ambitions we have around net zero em emission, about adaptation, about financing uh, new infrastructure via collaboration and tangible projects. So from being the first country to have a legally binding net zero target by 2050, to the planning we've done through our industrial, our transport, our energy, our building decarbonisation strategies, the United Kingdom has shown a clean growth in the last three decades of around 78% 70, growth in our economy with a 44% reduction in emissions. And that is a higher uh, rate than any other G7 country can claim. I think our uh, experience as a, of low carbon transition gives us credibility to talk about the challenges we faced, uh, the new ideas, the new, in, uh, the new ways of doing things that it has uh, caused, to share our successes and really to be able to support each other in this green journey. And of course, that is a big part uh, of our work globally, uh, particularly for my concert here in Hong Kong, beyond the negotiation in the Paris rulebook. And it's through discussions such as this uh, and other more specific technical engagements we have with organizations, with experts, looking at the latest innovation in business and pol good policy uh, challenges. It's fair to say that in Hong Kong, we've been incredibly impressed by the ambitious 2050 carbon neutral commitment made by the Hong Kong government and indeed by the newly announced Car climate action plan uh, that was mentioned to me not just by the Environment Secretary but by the Chief Executive when I saw her recently. And that builds on some earlier sectoral plans. But of course, uh, averting the worst effects of climate change, as the Professor has said, is going to require continued and sustained effort. And that needs to continue beyond November. And I think in that aspect, the United Kingdom and Hong Kong are roughly in the same place. We are both going to benefit from continued exchange at all levels, both government and at business level, to take forward our climate action and our adaptation plans. And when I spoke to the Environment Secretary, as he mentioned in his, his video to you, we identified areas such as renewable and new energy, electric vehicles, green buildings, as common themes between us here in, here in Hong Kong and in the United Kingdom, areas where British business has a particular expertise. It is fortunate that both in the United Kingdom and in Hong Kong, we have thriving businesses. We have a dynamic uh, professional community and civil society looking to be engaged in this space. And indeed, many of you are in this virtual space here today. We need all of you to join in and we need to expand that, uh, that community if we're going to sort of uh, win the race for two key reasons. Lowering global temperatures is going to require uh, real changes to the real economy. And I think for businesses, um, they need to look at the actions they're taking as, as, as business decisions. Action that is not in line with a net, zero, uh, a net zero path is not going to be good enough. You need to look at your business app, uh, impact, but also um, using the purchasing power you have as businesses to drive net zero. That will allow the impact you make individually to be multiplied many times over, and indeed will future-proof your own business. Secondly, we also need to work more closely with industry leaders and the professionals that actually have these green technologies and are the owners of these innovative ideas. And that's why we're asking business and civil society to work together regionally and internationally to bring transformation into all sectors. I'm going to end on sort of the final goal, which is around green finance. And here is an area where it is incumbent, I think, upon the world's greatest international financial centers, including London and Hong Kong, to step up and drive that green finance agenda. All aspects of the financial system, uh, from banking to investors to insurance companies, need to be mobilized to drive net zero. First, through ramping up their climate-related uh, financial disclosures, but also in having credible transition plans to which mainstream sustainable and green investment. There's a great statistic that globally, over the past 15 months, institutions supporting TCFD have grown by over 85%.
That accounts for about 1,500 organizations or institutions and is responsible for about 150 a trillion US dollars worth of assets. Now that's the sort of momentum we need to sustain and accelerate if as a global community we're going to win the race for zero. Thank you, Brian. Um, so next we have um, Mr. Ha Wei Cheung, the chairman of the Hong Kong Green Building Council. So uh, Ha Wei, we all know that the HKBGBC is very proactive in raising awareness and encourage the development of sustainable buildings in Hong Kong. So what do you see are the key challenges that the city is facing and what is HKGBC's role in helping to tackle those? Thank you, Professor, for inviting the Hong Kong Green Building Council uh, to share today uh, with our participants as to how we see the challenges for the building sector is, as well as uh, Hong Kong Green Building Council's role and opportunities in dealing with the challenge. Uh, as we all know, uh, Hong Kong has already set a target for reaching carbon neutral by 2054. Uh, the main challenge as we see it is in Hong Kong is too high, high density and high rise buildings. Uh, we also have a huge number of existing buildings whereby they emit 60% of our carbon emission and uh, consume 90% of our electricity. And of course, there is the issue of cost uh, to deal with as well as the need for mindset change. The key role of the Hong Kong Green Building Council is that we operate and manage the Beam Plus Hong Kong Green Building Rating System. Now, the system was originally designed to set standards of green buildings in Hong Kong and to give recognition for buildings, new buildings, which can live up to the standard required. We also use that as a basis for our education program. We are in the process of widening the scope of the Beam Plus rating system such that it can cover also high energy use buildings such as data center. We have published our data center Beam Plus rating system only two months ago. We are also in the process of improving our rating system to enable it to cover green finance including bond, mortgage, as well as other means of financial tools for investing in green buildings. The Hong Kong Green Building Council also provides guidance as to methodology in our green building design. We have issued smart and microclimate guidance for the uh, building professionals we are in the process of uh, designing a built environment guidebook for areas beyond our, ex our buildings so that we can uh, better utilize our natural light, light, air, and water resources. We are in the process of investigating how we can make the best use of our external wall, such that our walls can at the same time produce renewable energy and reduce heat penetration into our living environment. The second challenge that we have is our existing buildings. As I said before, our existing buildings consume 90% of our energy use. So it is a real challenge as to how we can improve any energy performance in existing building. We have been introducing a retrofit and recommissioning uh, program so as to improve our existing building energy performance. In this aspect, we started off uh, to introduce the business case to our developers and building owners as to how much energy saving they can achieve 
through retro commissioning. We have been meeting shop owners to impress upon them the need in running and operating their shop, how best they can, use, they can do to save energy use. We are now running a large program to train technicians in management and operating existing building energy system such that they are equipped to improve energy performance in existing building. The other area that we are now working on is to deal with the issue of cost in running our existing buildings and improving our existing buildings and new buildings. We think we have been advocating that the cost is really an investment for health, social and corporate, uh, fin uh, corporate ESG. Uh, it can improve property value and rental return. We are also improving our rating system, as I said before, to cover different types of green financing. We, we of course have to educate the public by introducing mindset change. We think if we are able to work on our building professionals, our building developers, we would be in a much better position to change our mindset. Apart from buildings, we feel that we have to go beyond our buildings as well if we were to meet the 2050 carbon neutral target. We have been advocating the need to look at the external environment outside our buildings, at our infrastructure, at our open space, at our water, to see how we can make the best use of these natural elements, our light, our sunlight, our, our air, how they can best be utilized to improve ventilation, natural ventilation, heat reduction. We also think there is perhaps also a need for us in Hong Kong, being a small community, to look beyond Hong Kong at our neighboring economic zone, such as the Greater Bay Area. I think there is a huge potential if we were to work together with cities in the Greater Bay Area so that we can make the best use of facilities in the Greater Bay, for example, in the production of green product. Our green building material comes from the Greater Bay. So if we were to be able to source from the Greater Bay, we can have better uh, green product for use in construction. The last thing to conclude is that I think we have to collaborate. We need to collaborate with research institutes such as universities. We need to collaborate with the financial sector in being able to make the best use of our green finance as a source for improving existing building as well as improving the design of new green buildings. We have to work with the general public in engaging our citizens to work together with the professionals, with developers, and with us in improving the whole built environment. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Hawaii. Um, so the Last uh, panelist is Ms. Nicole Wong, the CEO of WWF Hong Kong. So Nicole, as a long-term advocate of safeguarding the natural world, WWF has announced that the struggle for a sustainable future will be won or lost in our cities. So how can the integration of nature within our city be part of the solution to combat climate change? Thank you, Professor Chen, and uh, for the introduction, and also Arab inviting W of Hong Kong to share our view in the, about the nature-based solution. And for WWF Hong Kong, we think that nature-based solution is very important to reduce greenhouse gas emission and also um, help us to adapt to the impact of climate change. Um, it is a win-win solutions that 
involve protecting, restoring, and also sustainably manage the ecosystem to address the society um, uh, challenge and protect human well-being. Forest is most well-known uh, ecosystem that um, using as an example uh, for the nature-based solution for climate change. But there's also many other um, example, including like um, mangrove, wetland, coral reef, and some <coughs> other landscape. There's uh, a lot of evidence that already proves the adverse weather um, it happened in Hong Kong, uh, and also Hong Kong is not immune to climate change. And this is some pictures that I took right after the impact of the typhoon Mankut that impact Hong Kong in the September of 2018. And some very actually a sad story. And you can see two gentlemen um, walking back to the nature reserve. It was taken, the pictures were taken right after lower down of the uh, signal number, typhoon signal number 10. And a very long old, uh, Going to work journey is normally take 10 minutes for the drive, but we take two hours by walking back to the nature reserve on that day. We check the facility and also we check the nearby local community. Is there any impact? Um, so for the next slide, um, actually for the wetland, if you have been uh, go to my pool nature reserve, um, you can see that um, the, at that time, the main, uh, the Maipo Nature Reserve and the nearby wetland, they really act like a spongy that absorbs the excessive flood water. And also, the topic that I like with today is um, it is also a carbon sink. So at that day, you can see these pictures showing uh, uh, we took on that day that um, the whole Maipo Nature Reserve was flooded. And at the top right-hand corner, there's a, a blue color box. If you can guess what it is, it is very important facility at Maipo. It is a toilet. But at that day, it was floating due to the typhoon. And a lot of facilities was um, affected and impacted. So a lot of us may not aware until the impact of that severe typhoon. But do you know that Hong Kong actually have a lot of um, uh, natural resources that can help us to combat climate change? And people, a lot of people we got, we are living in a well-developed city with a lot of hard infrastructure. But do you know that we also have rich natural, natural environment, which are very important natural assets that can help us to combat climate change? And more than 40% of our land um, are protected area, including country parks. And also, they are covered by uh, dense vegetation, also like wetlands, mangrove, and fish pond. And the case that I want to share is actually happened at Maipo, that has uh, recently developed and implemented a nature-based solution project. You may know that Hong Kong government appointed WF Hong Kong to conserve Maipo wetland for more than almost 40 years. And we, when we set up the nature reserve, it was known by the very rich biodiversity and also it is as a bird paradise. And go beyond the conventional habitat management, recently we introduced and also implemented the nature-based solution project right there. We have partnership with corporate, including like um, HSBC, to bring in nature-based solution projects and also using MIPO as the testing grant to address climate change challenge. And the project, it is now being implemented. This is a five-year project. We call it the power, our, Powering Our Wetland Project. And for any um, NBS project, we focus on a few elements. That is, it must be people-focused element, and also co-benefit for the society, economy, and nature. And in that project, we aim to enhance carbon sink through mangrove protection and restoration. We continue to protect the natural habitat, including the mangrove, inside and outside the Maipo Nature Reserve. That is about 400 hectares of area with um, the mango forest in Hong Kong. It is the largest mango forest right there. And we also identify suitable location 
for example, some of the gateways already up or and fish pond already have been abandoned by the fish farmer, and we try to introduce some active management um, uh, uh, work and restore the natural habitat. And the other one is we aim to build carbon resilience with eco, eco fish pond. We work with the local community, fishermen, and also local villages to identify suitable fish pond that allow us to setting up floating solar panels that will be collected to the grid for fit-in tariff. Then they, they can bring in some uh, income and incentive for them to continue to keep that innovative and also um, continue to, the fit-in tariff. Without the whole process, we will provide technical and also financial assistance during the project implementation phase for the uh, fish pond owner so that they can actively maintain the work um, throughout the whole uh, nature-based solution project. And the project is now uh, under the uh, progress. And if you ask me, what is the key element for the success? I will tell you a few keywords. That is co-creation, collaboration, and also involve the local community. That is what I share with you just now, that talking about the nature-based solution that must have the people, <coughs> element, uh, element, uh, people element right there. So for this project, we've just um, implemented for um, our first years, and we have a lot of lessons learned right there, and also um, work with different uh, stakeholders to achieve the success in coming few years, collaborating with um, different corporate, and also um, work together um, on this project will help us to get more lesson learned and also get more experience uh, to contribute back to the project. One other very important element is WWF Hong Kong is a science-based um, organization. For all the project implementation, we, we go through the baseline research, monitoring, and continues to research. That can help us to understand better about the environment and also throughout the whole process, how we can improve further will help us to walk the talk and also bring us more experience that can help us to share with the others. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Um, so thank you very much for the insights from the panelists. And now it's time for questions from the <coughs> audience. And so if you have a question, uh, please type in, in the Q&A and then we will try to answer them uh, by from the panelists. So we actually have a, quite a few questions already. So the first question is uh, to all the panelists, that it's evident that the need for climate change mitigation and adaptation is real. The government has already set very ambitious decarbonization targets, and the private sector is catching up. So what are the private and public financial <coughs> incentives that can be adopted to speed up the decarbonization process? And what are the frameworks that need to be in place for this to happen? So uh, who would like to Start. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah. So I, 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 I think first what I'd make is this is a it's a holistic process, both in terms of pulling together public and pri uh, public policy and the private sector to determine what sort of incentives or regulations are appropriate uh, for those businesses, but also for the for the economy. And so I think part of you know part of the answer to this is around the frameworks being built to allow. Um, exchange of opinion between public and private sector by bringing experts together. I think green finance uh, is obviously something that people talk a lot about. Um, you know, in the United Kingdom, we're fortunate that we have uh, Mark Carney, a former governor of the Bank of England, who is the Prime Minister's um, finance advisor for COP26 and the UN Special Envoy. He's actually going to be speaking at an event with Brit Cham here in Hong Kong next week. But it's that sort of engagement that brings together ideas from the private sector, new ideas, innovative ideas that will work for businesses that can also work for the public sector. And it's worth remembering that financial centers like Hong Kong and London um, are renowned for their innovation. I mean, the reason they are so successful is because they have adapted. And I think it is about uh, structuring those conversations between private sector pr practitioners and the policy uh, advisors to government that will, that will create the incentives that are appropriate for each market, but also the sort of incentives that will actually work for business. So speaking of the finance impacts, um, H HW actually mentioned about uh, green buildings, the cost for developing green buildings as an investment. So how do you link this 
cost and investment to the financial sector uh, that we can try to encourage more people to do this type of green building. Uh, as you know, uh, the uh, property market in Hong Kong uh, 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 is a big contribution to our economy. Uh, on, uh, on, on that basis, on that background, I think if we were to be able to, through the financing, through green financing, we are able to provide more incentives, financial incentives for improving the design of our new buildings as well existing buildings, uh, we can do a lot in improving. Uh, for example, um, the uh, property sector, the, the, the residential property sector, uh, uh, accounts for a lot of the, uh, uh, the new buildings that we build. And if we are able to provide green mortgage to residential buildings on a much larger scale, we should be able to provide more incentive uh, for enticing uh, the new green building construction. Uh, now, on existing building improvement, I think if we were to uh, regenerate uh, and synergize together with urban regeneration, uh, improvement to our, our, our existing buildings in terms of its use, then we should be able to uh, combine uh, building energy improvement with uh, urban regeneration. Great. Um, so here's another question for you, <laughs> Hawaii. Now, Hong Kong's latest climate action plan has a strong focus on reducing the operational carbon, which is great. But what are the plans and targets to, for the embodied carbon in our building and envi built environment in the near future? Um, I, I think uh, uh, in, in dealing with uh, uh, a building issue, uh, for embodied carbon, uh, I think we need to look at our building material and the way we construct our new buildings. As regard green building, ma green building material is concerned, uh, the Construction Industry Council together with the Hong Kong Green Building Council uh, is now operating on a green product certification uh, system uh, whereby uh, we assess the, in, uh, the embedded carbon in our building material and uh, having uh, assessed uh, the, uh, uh, the, its uh, embedded carbon uh, for those we are doing well we issue a certificate and this would encourage a lot in the use in reducing embedded carbon uh, in our building material and construction. The other area we need to look at is, uh, is the, the construction process. The recent introduction of MIC, uh, Modular Integrated Construction, uh, as, well as well as other construction methods uh, on construction site, uh, there is a lot of potential in reducing uh, our uh, energy use on construction site as well. Okay, um, so let me switch my question to Nicole. So um, as natural systems are not limited by national boundaries, so how important is WWF's role in linking local projects to in the international context? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think WWF have the role to play, particularly um, sharing on the successful um, example that done in locally, and then also collecting um, different projects together. Um, as the question uh, asked, it, um, ecosystem is um, go beyond the boundary. The impact of greenhouse gas emission also go beyond the boundary. So um, for the project that I just mentioned and share with you, we not we aim not only to conduct it um, in Hong Kong, but we also want to bring up the idea um, cross the border that we can uh, identify a suitable location that can be implemented in the Greater Bay Area. And as you know, the, ma the mangrove uh, ecosystem 
um, the, um, the inner debate is one of the example, and actually it's linked up to the um, whole ecosystem in the Greater Bay Area. So um, if the um, pilot project that we conduct will be success, then that will be a very um, uh, exciting example that we can share um, uh, in a bigger uh, location. Also, for WWF, I think um, we have been working with corporate uh, for many years and linking up the uh, corporate network and also uh, through our uh, platform to share with more country will definitely help people to exchange ideas, change the mindset, and also bring in new initiatives. So um, in the upcoming futures, we look forward to collaborate with more um, parties and do the engagement and collaboration for the wider context of the um, society and also more, more countries. I like this idea you said about the uh, collaboration uh, among different stakeholders. So WWF is obviously an NGO, but uh, so how do you, do you think that you can actually work with the private sector in moving forward in terms of uh, combating climate change? Yeah, so um, working on the um, combating climate change projects, um, I think just for WWF Hong Kong, we have been starting working on that for more than 10 to 15 years. And without the whole um, experience and journey, it's not easy at the very beginning. But I think uh, for the um, uh, recent uh, uh, work that uh, suggested by the government that we aim to achieve the net zero by 2015, more corporate, they are aimed to do um, more within their own operations. And for that, some of those may be um, already start up their work, uh, reduce the carbon emission for a long, long time, but how they can do more and how they can really uh, 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 achieve the less zero, then that may need more technical advice and innovative ideas. I think for that, just like what I share, um, collecting people together, using us as a, uh, uh, creating more platform for the dialogue to discuss, that is one of the those. And for a lot of um, new corporate, um, they may be SME or they are just a newly startup uh, company. They may not have much experience or they want to know more. Then I think as an NGO like WWF Hong Kong, we, it definitely is a platform for us to um, through different events, through different uh, dialogue um, channels that can link people together and then to share the experience and also promote further collaboration between not only corporates, NGO, but also different stakeho uh, stakeholders. Like what I say, um, the uh, nature-based solution project, it must have the people elements and benefiting the um, nature, economy, and local community is something that um, just go beyond between the corporates. But um, the NGO can definitely play a role to link up all the sector together. Thank you. Um, so here's another question for uh, Hawaii. So the zero carbon building was built quite some time ago. So what experience uh, can we gain from that and how can we use that experience to further the agenda on reducing carbon? The uh, zero carbon building was built uh, almost 10 years ago. Uh, the building has been evolving uh, since it was built. Uh, it was meant to be evolving. Uh, uh, be, uh, as the question has raised, has mentioned that the technology that we use for uh, our uh, green buildings ha have been improving. And there is a need, of course, for the zero carbon building to be retro commissioned and retrofitted from time to time so that new technology can be used and introduced in the uh, zero carbon building. And indeed, if we were to go there, you would be able to see new uh, ENM uh, plants, air conditioning systems, and uh, fans being installed. Uh, such a way, in, in such a way that uh, it can further improve its energy uh, performance. Uh, the other improvement it has made is, uh, it is now using groundwater. Uh, there is an outlet running through 
the the uh, the 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 very bottom part of the uh, of the building, and we are now using uh, water from the lona to cool the air conditioning system. Uh, you, as you will probably be aware that the uh, zero carbon building is now called a zero carbon park. Uh, there, there is now a, a very well visited uh, park outside the building itself, uh, whereby through the uh, management of the park, uh, improving uh, shading in the park, uh, improving public facility in the park, uh, the park is now uh, uh, enjoyed uh, by people working uh, in office buildings uh, around the park. So uh, we, we are moving on from uh, green building uh, to cover uh, the whole built environment, uh, whereby a park is involved, any public area, and we also hope to be able to uh, improve the uh, working environment uh, of the whole area. As you will probably be aware, there are now uh, weather and wind monitoring systems installed, not only in the park, and we are trying to install them in buildings around the park so that we can better monitor the whole built environment. So it is a, uh, what we can learn is that uh, we don't uh, look at buildings alone, we go beyond buildings. Uh, uh, any uh, uh, a building, a green building, uh, need to be an evolving uh, building whereby uh, any new technological improvements are incorporated. So those are the two things that I think uh, we, we have learned from building and operating the, uh, the zero carbon park. Thank you, thank you, uh, Howard. Right. Um, so, let me ask Brian a related question. So, the <coughs> UK has been um, doing very well in um, this green building and is championing a lot of uh, green building measures. So, do you think that the, the UK can now uh, help or contribute your experience towards our further development of green buildings in Hong Kong? So I hope so, yes. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, that's, that's certainly sort of one of the jobs. I think uh, it's from here to sort of talk to the Hong Kong government and to the private sector here just to sort of see what the opportunities are. I would say that the, you know, what, what is uh, fantastic about Hong Kong is the ambition that has been shown by the government, both in setting its 2050 target, but also in setting out a very clear set of priorities for how Hong Kong is going to sort of move towards net zero. And what we can do, I think, uh, which relates to your question about green building, is to talk about areas where the UK and UK businesses have some expertise, where we have perspective, where we've had new ideas, perhaps where we've had some bad ideas, and share that. And so this is a part of a, a dialogue and a holistic process to work together to help achieve what uh, Hong Kong has set out. So certainly, and I think if you speak to uh, Arup and other sort of engineering companies from the UK, you will hear a lot from them about what they can do to support uh, this agenda around build, green building. That sounds great. So. Um we have a couple of minutes, uh, so if you have any more questions, uh, please pop in now, or we will, you'll have to reserve the questions uh, to, by emailing to our panelists. Now, uh, while we're waiting for other questions, uh, so let me ask the panelists uh, a, a general question. Is What do you think, um, after you've listening, listened to uh, uh, Mr. Wong about the uh, Climate Action Plan 2050, um, in your sector, what do you think, uh, Nicole, and also Hawaii, uh, what do you think will be the best way you can help achieve this uh, climate action plan? Uh, I'll start with uh, Hawaii. Yeah, I, I think Mr. Wong mentioned uh, the need uh, for, uh, for green building uh, uh, to be uh, uh, built in Hong Kong uh, and, and, and to be improved in its energy performance. Now I think uh, um, I think we need to investigate uh, our green building design uh, with a focus on reducing uh, energy use in such a way that 
we should be able to uh, reach the 2050 carbon neutral target. I think, we, uh, as I said uh, just now, I think we need to uh, in, look into how we can make the best use of our external wall. Uh, this is the, the interfacing part uh, with uh, the people working, living in building, and the interfacing part with the natural environment outside in terms of air, sunlight, uh, water, rainwater maybe as well. Uh, the other area I think we need to uh, uh, really work on is our existing building stock, uh, which uh, consumes 90% uh, of the electricity that we have. Uh, uh, I, I, uh, I, I think uh, retro commissioning, uh, retrofitting, I was, I was informed by the technical experts that uh, even just through recommissioning, which means adjusting your existing uh, ENM system, you should be able to achieve considerable saving in energy. Uh, not to mention retrofitting. Uh, if you were to uh, retrofit your old plants with new ones, uh, because of technological improvement, uh, there can be even greater saving in energy uh, consumption. So those are the areas that I think uh, uh, we need to work on. Uh, and, and of course, there is the issue of cost uh, involved uh, in uh, existing building and new building improvement. Uh, and we now have the green finance. Uh, and, and green mortgage uh, that we need to take on. Great. One minute, Nicole. <laughs> okay, very quick. Um, we actually mentioned a lot of technical terms just today, and a lot of public actually they may not totally understand what that means. That zero climate peak. Uh, or carbon emission. So I think as an NGO that we uh, engage many stakeholders, including the general public, we will continue our work to do the uh, public communication work, like our Earth Hour continues to be organized, so that more people understand what it is about and understand if they can really adapt those um, uh, 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 measurements in their daily life, then that can really help us, every one of us in the city, that to achieve the last zero. Okay, thank you. So. Time flies, and that's all the time we have. And let me thank all our panelists uh, for their insightful discussions. And thank you very much for the audience to join this session. Thank you. Many thanks again for all the speakers that have contributed to today's sessions. I think we saw some wonderful insights, especially as while all speakers have very different uh, perspectives, they all share the common goal of decarbonizing. Now remember that today is only the first out of five webinars that we're hosting from Hong Kong. So tomorrow we have our second webinar, during which we'll focus on the first theme out of four, which is decarbonizing the built environment. Now again, we have an excellent lineup of speakers, so I hope you join us then for another good discussion. Thank you.